Well, I want to invite you to uh, take your Bibles and open them up to Acts 18, uh, verses 1 through 17 is where we're going to be at this morning. You know, I, I wrestled about whether or not to change this message, even, even as, early, uh, as late as, as uh, yesterday. I just went back and forth. Should I change the message or, or should I continue to preach in the book of Acts? And there may be a, a time where we, we change the message uh, to, to, to really connect or to speak to uh, what's going on right now. The Bible has a lot to say about uh, what we're going through right now. But, our, but the more I studied this passage and the more I prepared, the more I realized just how much this passage has to say to us right now in this moment. In fact, I think it's a, a unique grace of God that we come to this passage at, at this point in time. You see, Paul's on his second missionary journey, and he's just left Athens, and, and now he makes his way down to Corinth. And Corinth was a city that needed the gospel. And Bend is a city that needs the gospel. Maybe now more than ever. And, and in Paul's example, we see how we can minister to a city in need of the gospel. Let me read the passage uh, together with you. Acts 18 1 through 17. After this, Paul left Athens and went down to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and he worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments, and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads, for I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there, and he went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And so Paul stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews united, made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves, for I refuse to be a judge of these kind of things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes and the ruler of the synagogue and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, as we come before you, God, we acknowledge that you are the same today and yesterday and forever. We recognize, God, that you are everlasting and eternal, that you rule and that you reign. And Lord, we put our hope and our faith and our trust not in man, not in science, not in anything other than you. And so, Lord, where we're fearful today, would you strengthen us with courage? Father, where we are uh, apprehensive about things going on, Father, would you remind us of your, of your wonderful sovereign hand? And Father, may we trust that you are at work causing all things to work together for your good and for our good and for your glory. And so, Lord, we pray this morning through your word that you would teach us wherever we are, 
teach us, Lord, and help us to know how that we can minister to our city that is in so much need, not just physical need, Lord, but even greater, a spiritual need that many don't realize that they, they need. And so, Lord, would you teach us now from your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So beginning in verse 1, we see here that, that Paul teaches us uh, how to do ministry in a city in need. Verse 1, after this, Paul left Athens and went down to Corinth. Now, Paul had been in Athens, and he makes his way down to Corinth. And Corinth was a city that desperately needed the gospel. It was a key city of the region, maybe about 200,000 people at the time. It was a prosperous city. It had two major trade routes that allowed uh, many, many people to come there. And, and just like any kind of seaport, it had people going in and out all the time. Uh, and it was very prosperous, but people weren't planted there. And uh, it was also a city that was a hotbed of idolatry. There was a, a temple to Aphrodite that overlooked the city uh, where it was said that a thousand temple prostitutes would come out at night uh, to serve the city. And so you can just kind of imagine the kind of depravity that existed in Corinth. And Paul knew that Corinth needed the gospel. And so he made his way down from Athens to this city. This city, Corinth, it, one commentator describes it as the Las Vegas of the ancient world. And so you can just imagine somebody saying, hey, Whatever happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. And that was kind of the place that Corinth was. Now we can imagine that that's the place we would not want to go, right? We would not want to bring our families to. We would not want to be around. And, and yet, that's exactly where Paul realizes that the gospel needs to go. That's exactly where we have been called to go to people in need. Corinth was a city that was desperately in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, we live in a very different city. Ben's a very different city than Corinth. We're relatively small. We're family-oriented. People look out for one another. But it's also a city that desperately needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because being a good neighbor is not what brings us salvation. It's not what reconciles us to God. Only faith in Jesus Christ will reconcile us to God. And our city desperately needs to know who Jesus is and what he's done. And so now, maybe, maybe more than ever, Ben needs the hope of the gospel because even if nothing happens to us from this virus, even if we keep going and living our lives, eventually, one day, every single person will leave this earth. And they will stand before a righteous God. And, and, and they will give an account for their life. And if they are not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, they will face the righteous wrath of God the Father. And so our city desperately needs the gospel. And we have been sent to share it. We, the church, we have been given the message. We have been given the hope. And so there's so much that we can learn from the Apostle Paul today. The first thing that we learn is that we are not called to minister alone. We're not called to minister alone. We don't have to do this by ourselves alone. God has given us the family of God, the church, to assist us. Notice the very first thing that Paul does when he enters into a new city is he tries to find believers in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now, we don't know if Paul had heard about Priscilla and Aquila before he had reached Corinth, that somebody had said to them, hey, when you get to Corinth, look for Priscilla and Aquila. They're, they're followers of Jesus Christ. And, and they, they actually 
they actually have the same trade as you, Paul. They're, they're a leather worker. They're a tent maker. So go and, and find them. We don't know if that's the case, or we don't know if Paul, while he was going to synagogue, met this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, and as they were talking, realized that they too believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. But Luke gives us clues that they were believers. Now, now he says that they were Jews who had been exiled from Rome. Now, history tells us the reason that this particular group of Jews had been exiled from Rome or Italy was because they worshipped Christ. And so these Jews that had been scattered out of Italy or out of Rome, they were followers of Jesus, of Jewish descent. And, and so here Paul finds other believers. We know that from other mentions of Aquila and Priscilla, not only did Aquila and Priscilla become great friends of the Apostle Paul, but they became partners in ministry and partners in the gospel. You see, we are not called to minister alone. We're called to do it together in community as a family. And right now, we need one another. Maybe, maybe more than ever before, we need one another. This is not the time for us to, to stop communicating and, and sharing and caring for one another. We, do, we just have to be creative in the ways that we do it. We need to be encouraging one another. And so I want to challenge you this week. Who are a few people that you can reach out to? Maybe send a text. Maybe jump on a video call. Maybe shoot them an email. Maybe be creative. I don't know, send them a homing pigeon, something. But, but be encouraging to those around you. Maybe you want to volunteer to, to watch someone's children. Or, or maybe you want to go out and buy them toilet paper, right? I know you're all laughing at home, but I'll just, I'll just trust that. But we need to do something for one another, right? We need to encourage each other and care for each other and, and love each other in this time. We need one another. We were never meant to do life alone. That's why this is so isolating as, as we're maybe stuck at home. That, and it's, and it's going to be isolating in ways. that We need to make sure that we don't let it stay that way. We need to be reaching out to one another in safe and significant ways. And we need to be creative about that. But, but we need one another. Now, Paul was a tent maker by trade, but he was an evangelist at heart. And so the next thing that we see here is that we don't need to be in a full-time pastor to minister the gospel. We don't need to be a full-time pastor to minister the gospel. Notice that Paul was working and preaching. Paul had a trade and he had a mission. It tells us in the text that he he went and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. And he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Paul was a, a tent maker on the weekdays. He served people in his community by, by good work, like many, like the majority of you do, serving and being a benefit to the community. And then he also he, he was a, a, a blessing to his city and providing for the economics of the city. He was a blessing to the city by working. But we also see that he was an evangelist. He reasoned with people in the synagogue. He, he told them about Jesus. He tried to convince them from the scriptures who Jesus was. Now, the majority of you uh, listening, you, you, you work a, a job, right? You work a full-time job. You have a different missional environment than, than maybe I do in a sense that, that my job is full-time at the church. And some people think, well, because you're full-time at the church, your job, right, is ministry, but my job is is something else. And Paul reminds us here that that's not the case. That all of us, every single one of us, has been called to be a missionary of the gospel. We just do it in different ways. And so God's given you a place and a trade, and He's called you to be a minister of the gospel, right? We need to figure out how we do that. Now, most of the time, you're uh, you're going you're gonna to work hard for the glory of God and serve your city. And as you do that, look for opportunities to be able to share the truth and to be salt and light. 
No matter what your day job is, whether you're a, a waiter or a stay-at-home mom or a tradesman or maybe even a student, we've all been called to follow this example that Paul gives us to serve our city, to bless people, to bless people through our work, and to be a witness of the gospel. You have been called to be a missionary wherever the Lord has put you. Now, I'm sure that the people in the city of Corinth, they had all kinds of physical needs that Paul probably saw and probably even tried to meet some of those. But Paul recognizes that the most important need that these people have is not physical. It's spiritual. And just like him, number three, we must recognize the true need of people is spiritual. The third thing that Paul teaches us here is that we must recognize the true need of people is spiritual. Look what it says there at the end of verse 4. And he, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus You see, Paul knew that the greatest need of the people was to understand who Jesus was and what Jesus did. So he reasoned with them. We talked about that a few weeks ago. That means he just discussed with them, dialogued with them, talked about about life and, and pointed them to who Jesus was in the midst of that. He was occupied with the word and he was testifying that Jesus was the Christ. This is what we've been called to. Now there are there are many things that we can do for people during this difficult season. And just like Jesus, it is it is right for us to try to meet the physical needs of people. You may have neighbors that will need things. You should try to meet those needs. You may have somebody in your neighborhood that's sick and and you should desire to go out if you're healthy and and get them what they need and and bring it to their home. There are many ways that we're going to be able to serve one another and serve our city in this time. But if that's all that we do, then we really have not helped people very much. Jesus met physical needs, but it was always so that he could help them with their greater need, which was the spiritual need of their separation from a holy God. We we must follow his example. And it will take courage, it will take love, it will take conviction, but we must let people know why we are serving them, why we are loving them. And it is because Jesus loves them and because Jesus has shown his love to us. We must help people understand that their greatest need is not physical. It's not a virus. It's spiritual. It's separation from God. It's, a, it's wrath that is coming if they don't turn and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is the message that we have been given. They need Jesus. And so we need to reason and persuade and testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to do it in a loving way and in a winsome way. But we have to be bold and we have to share the truth. And when we do that, there will be two different responses. And we should prepare ourselves for that. There will be a response of rejection. And sometimes there will be a response of reception. And that's okay. Look at verse 6. They rejected Paul in a significant way, and and yet he persevered. Verse 6, And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments, and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, I don't know about you, but it's hard to know when this moment comes When do we decide that a person's heart is hardened to the point where we can no longer, where we're going to move on and go to someone else? I don't know. I think we have to seek the Lord for that, ask the Lord for that. I don't know if we we ever really, people that we love and that we're close to, if we ever get to that kind of point. But there will be moments with people, maybe at work and things like that, who who just reject us and, and, and we have to be, Uh, 
the honoring of, of that. We don't want to beat them over the head with the gospel. We want to love them towards Christ. But Paul decides that, that these people have made up their minds. They are rejecting Jesus Christ. And, and so he, he shows them physically the consequences of the decision that has just been made. It says that he, he uh, shook out his garments. This, he, and he tells them, your blood be on your own heads. This is symbolism that Jesus had even taught his disciples, but this, this blood be on your own heads is from Ezekiel 33, verses 4 through 6. And there Ezekiel says to his people, If anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. This is a warning to God's shepherds, to God's leaders, that we must be faithful in proclaiming the warning. How can people know if, if, they, if they don't know the truth? How will people know that they need to respond to God? This is, this is the job that we have been given as God's church. It is, it is to love people, but part of that love is to tell them that they desperately need salvation through Jesus Christ. They need to recognize and understand or know that, that they are under the, the righteous condemnation of God for their sin. That their sin has separated them from God. That that, that sin, if it not dealt with, will face the wrath of a holy God. But, but because God loved them, He sent His Son Jesus, who died on the cross for their sins. Who rose from the grave to eternal life. And who offers salvation to any who will respond and receive it in faith and That is the message that we've been given. That's the message our city desperately needs. So we must remember that while there will be many physical problems, the greater issue in our city is the spiritual ones. And friends, if, if, if you are listening, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I hope you hear the warning of God's word this morning. Please realize how serious it is for you to reject him. That this judgment that's coming would be now by your decision that you would reject this God. And those of us that are believers, that that we would recognize how serious this actually is. And that it would compel us out of love to share the message of hope and faith in Jesus Christ. We We will share the gospel. But the reality is, sometimes when we share the gospel, people will reject the truth. And that leads us to the fourth thing that we learn from the ministry of Paul. And that is, we need to go where God gives opportunity. We need to go where God gives opportunity. Verse 7, And he left there, and he went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door, to the synagogue. You see, sometimes people will reject us and other times people will uh, accept the message. And so, so we must persevere. There will be people that receive the message. And so if we're rejected, we must keep going on. We must persevere. And Paul gives us an example of that. Looking for opportunities. If one door gets shut, move to the next door. Share the gospel. Now Paul moves right next door to the synagogue, and I, I just can't imagine how awkward that must have been. Maybe Paul was out at the door, like, "Man, hey, go to the synagogue uh, and face judgment, or come here with us." Well, choice is yours, right? I mean, Paul's so brave, and uh, he probably knows what's coming, what kind of attack is going to come against him because of this choice. But he perseveres. He loves these people, and he goes right next door, and he keeps compelling them to come and to hear the gospel. And we see that it pays off. Look at verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed 
in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Paul's perseverance bears fruit. And so will ours in time. In time, as we persevere, God will be faithful to his word. So don't give up. Keep being faithful and keep sharing the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now now notice here how baptism and belief are connected. That, That when we put our trust in Christ, the first act of obedience is to join God's church. It is to be publicly proclaimed a member of God's family in the body of Christ. It is to make our faith visible in public to the world. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if for some reason you have yet to be baptized, I want to urge you to take this seriously and to realize that the very first step of obedience to following Jesus is to be baptized. And if you want to talk to somebody, I'm available uh, through, through a phone, text, all those kinds of things. Uh, I'll even meet with you <laughs> if, if you want. Uh, I'm available to, to talk to you about baptism. There's other elders that would love to do that as well. But you need to be baptized. It's the first step of obedience. And here we see that the two are connected, one and the other. Verse 9, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking And do not be silent. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was studying this, this seems so strange. That Paul is, people are getting saved, and people are getting baptized, and things are going amazing. And then verse 9 tells us that Paul needs to be encouraged because he's afraid. Now, Now, why is that? Well, I think it's because Paul's been in this story before many other locations. And Paul thinks that, okay, the ruler of the synagogue just came to faith in Christ. The Jews are not going to be happy about that. People are getting saved. They're getting baptized. People are not going to be happy about that. Guess what's coming next? Prison, beating, persecution. Paul figured it was just about to come, and so he better pack his bags and get ready to go. But then God comes to him. And he gives him this promise, a promise that that we also so desperately need to be reminded of. And that's the fifth thing that we see here. The fifth thing we learn from Paul's ministry is that we need to trust in the promises of God. Friends, we need to trust in the promises of God. And here, here was God's promise to Paul. Do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I, I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. God says, Paul, you don't need to fear, for I am with you. Now this first promise that God makes to the Apostle Paul, this is a promise to you and to me as well. It's a promise to us. The second promise here, that you'll be okay, I'll take care of you, you won't get beaten, that's a specific promise to Paul at a specific time. And we'll see that that's not always the case, and, and that's okay. But the first promise is a promise to all of us. God says, do not be afraid. I am with you. God says it all over in the Scriptures. Friends, be reminded, Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. For whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Isaiah 41, 13-14 tells us, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who says to you, Fear not, for I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm of Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Psalm 46.1 tells us, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. And Romans 8.38-39 says these precious words, 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, including the coronavirus, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And friends, the list could go on and on and on and on. If you are secure in Christ, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. I want to encourage you this week. I want to encourage you to study the promises of God. Maybe go online and look for verses that deal with with fear. Maybe go on and just look for verses that deal with the promises of God. I want you to go on and I want you to be reminded of of the truth that God loves you, that He holds you, that you are secure in Him and nothing, nothing can change that. We need to be reminded of that. And then I want you to share that with someone else. If you're on social media, I want you to stop posting fear garbage. And I want you to post encouragement. I want you to remind people who God is and what he, how He's in charge and, and how we are secured in Christ. Let's use our influence for the purpose of encouraging others and encouraging one another in this. Would you do that with me? You see, if Paul needed encouragement at a time of fearfulness, how much more do every single one of us from time to time need encouragement? Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Hold on to the promise of our Lord. But not only do we see the the need to trust in the promises of God, but we also see the need to trust in the sovereignty of God. The sixth thing we see here is that we need to trust in the sovereignty of God. Why could Paul know that this work that he was doing was not in vain? It was because of God's promise. Look at the last part of that verse there. It says, For I have many in this city who are my people. Here's one of the clearest verses on God's sovereignty in saving people. There are many, many verses in the Bible that are clear, but this is one of the clearest. God says, I have people that have yet to trust in me. They're they're my people, and I will draw them to myself. Now notice, this is right after verse 6, where he says, you have a responsibility. It is your responsibility to trust in Christ, but it is also God's sovereignty that saves us from our sin. You see, the Bible is clear on both of these truths. And and as followers of Jesus who hold to God's word in faith, we must hold to both of these. We must hold these in tension. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. And we can't compromise on either. And in, in the mystery of that, we need to trust in our God. You see, as always, God's sovereignty is not meant to be a a theological idea that we fight over, but rather it is meant to be a glorious truth to comfort and give peace to God's people. Always when God's sovereignty is spoken about, it is spoken in the sense of giving peace to God's people. So if there's ever a time that we need to be reminded, we need to be reminded God is Sovereign. God says to Paul, Paul, you, you continue to be faithful, and I will continue to save. What a beautiful promise that is given to us that God is sovereign. Grace Bible Church, you remain faithful. I have many in this city, of, I have many in Central Oregon that, that, that are, have yet to know that they are going to be called by my name and I'm going to draw them to myself, but I need you to be faithful to go share the message so that they can respond to the gospel message of hope and truth. What a beautiful promise we've been given to take away all sense of fear, to take away all sense of intrepidation, to take away all sense that maybe our, our message won't be received or maybe it won't be, it won't be uh, we, we, we won't have success in our evangelism. God promises it. He says, listen, you be faithful and I will save 
people. What a promise we've been given. We need to trust in the sovereignty of God. You know, if that doesn't give us confidence to share the truth, then I don't know what will. We need to rest in that truth. And that goes not just for salvation. We need to trust in God's sovereignty even in the midst of a world pandemic. We don't know why God would choose to do the things the way he does them. And we don't need to know why. We don't know why other than this world is broken and it's, it's filled with sin and sin has affected it and, and causes all kinds of harm in everybody's lives every single day. And yet, we know that God works all things together for His good. We can trust God. We can trust His plan. That His plan is greater than we could ever possibly imagine. Let me ask you this. Is it worth the suffering and chaos that we might endure if God uses our suffering to lead millions of people to salvation in Jesus Christ? Which is better? A happy life that is temporal but leads to God's eternal wrath or an eternal life that endures suffering but leads someone to recognize their need for salvation and leads to eternal glory? We don't know what God's doing, but God has a plan. And we need to trust God in that plan. We need to recognize He is still on His throne. He is still sovereign over the nations. That He still has a mission for us. And that He is still accomplishing His glory through His church. I was just thinking about this morning. There are going to be... Thousands upon thousands of sermons that are streaming online this morning. YouTube and Facebook and all other places are just going to be filled with the gospel in a way that they've never been filled before. Maybe God's doing a mighty work that we can't see and we can't imagine. And God is bringing people to faith by His church's faithfulness. Let's remain. Let's remain faithful to what the Lord has called us to. And and the mission that we've been given, it's the same mission as the Apostle Paul. Verse 11, and and Paul stayed there a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. Our mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul Paul usually would go into an area and then leave, but here he stayed. He stayed because God promised him that there would be fruitfulness that would take place because people needed to be served. They needed to be discipled. They needed to know the hope of the gospel. And that is what our city needs. Our city needs us to be faithful. But then, as always, whenever there is faithful teaching, there will always be suffering and there will always be injustice. And here we see the final lesson from the Apostle Paul of how we minister to a city in need. And that is number seven, we need to be ready for suffering and injustice. We need to be ready for suffering and injustice. Friends, suffering and injustice marked the life of Paul, marked the life of the disciples, marked even Jesus himself. And if we are faithful to the gospel, it will be a part of our lives as well. Verse 12, we see that, 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 that suffering comes. Verse 12, but when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Injustice and suffering will come if we are faithful to the gospel. But notice here that God is also faithful to his promise to the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 14. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves, for I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. You see, God protects Paul. Because God is faithful to his promises. 
But notice the last verse. Things don't go so well for a guy named Sothenes. In verse 17, And they all seized Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. You see, again, we're reminded that suffering and injustice are a part of our world. And especially if we're faithful to the gospel, they are going to be a part of our experience. Now, we don't know if Sothenus is the same person that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians, but chances are it probably is. And so Sothenus is either a believer here who the Jews and Gentiles take their frustration out and beat him up because Paul is under protection in a way, or whether he comes to faith later on, maybe even because of circumstances just like this. But either way, it should be a reminder to us that suffering and injustice are just a part of this world. And friends, that should remind us that this world is not our home. This is not what God had in store for us. This sinfulness, this brokenness, this disease. No, God has a much greater plan. And God is at work. And one day, He will restore all of creation. There will be a new heaven and a new earth that will be restored creation. And there will be no disease. There will be no sickness. There will be no suffering. And God will rule and He will reign. But only those that have placed their faith and their trust in in His Son, Jesus Christ, who have acknowledged themselves as a sinner and called out to Him for salvation, will experience that life that God has designed for us to have. And so this, this world is not what we have been made for. We have been made to share something so much better. That's why we long for something better than this. And that's why we have a message that is better to share with people. Better than you can be inoculated from a disease. No, no. We have a greater message. You can be eternally secure because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And so let's be faithful to that message. Let's learn from Paul. Let's reach out to our city in need. Let's love and serve and pray for our neighbors, especially in this time. But let's also share the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Let's meet physical needs, but let's meet spiritual needs. Let's be faithful to what God's called us to. And no matter what, let's trust in the promises and the sovereignty of our God. Let's pray. Father, God, we we just stop to um, recognize, Lord, our need and our dependence on you. Father, we we are so finite. And Lord, this disease is just a reminder of how absolutely dependent upon you we really are. And God, I pray that you would use this moment collectively in our world, Father, to draw people to yourself, that people would, would realize their need for you, to realize that they cannot save themselves, that they desperately need forgiveness and salvation in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, would you help us to be the church, to be faithful to what you've called us to do, to love people the way that you've called us to love them? And, Lord, give us boldness and courage and confidence. We need it. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.